Welcome to lecture 10 of this training course on seismic resistant design of RCC residential building based on IS code. In our previous lecture, we looked upon some design considerations for the design of foundation for our residential building. We looked at some of the codal provisions in IS code 456 for the design of footings. We looked at some of the aspects that need to be checked during the design of footings, including one-way and two-way shear, bending moment, and transfer of load from column to slab, etc. And in this lecture today, we will be looking at the design of an isolated footing for our residential building based on those codal provisions in an Excel sheet. First, as you can see on your screen, we have the model of our building in ETAPS here. We have already analyzed the building and it is in a locked state in the present. So let me perform design of the building. I can check on this or I can click on this concrete frame design and the software starts designing the structure. So our design is complete. Now. To design any isolated footing, we have to determine the reaction forces acting on the joints at the base of the building. That means, if you can remember, we fixed all of our joints on this base. We provided a fixed restraint so that the forces acting on these joints at the bases shall be three translational reactions and three rotational reactions. But since it is the case of isolated footing and the value of the rotations at the bases might be negligible or smaller. We are only interested in knowing the vertical reaction forces that are acting on these joints. So to know the value of these reaction forces, you can click on this icon here. This icon says display support spring reactions. Or you can also go to the menu display and then go to force stress diagrams and then go to support spring reactions so let's click on this and we want to see the reaction forces at the base of our building for the combination let me go here 1.5 dead load plus live load if you remember this 1.5 dead load plus live load combination was not one of the design combinations but rather at that time we just used these one design combination 1.5 dead load plus live load because we knew we would use the results of this combination at a later stage so we have to see the reaction forces based on this load combination 1.5 dead load plus live load uh, if you go through IS code. IS code gives us some conditions in which we have to select this dead load and live load combination for finding out the design reaction forces or in cases where we may have to use also the seismic force acting on the building to determine the reaction forces and for that if I go to my presentation in last presentation at the very first slide, we talked about the IS code 1904 1986 code of practice for design and construction of foundations in soils. If you go through this code, it has one or two clause which states the condition or which states the load combination that you have to use for finding out the reaction forces. So let me go back to my ETAPS model. At this time, I'm only interested in the dead load and live load combination, and I choose the plot type to be arrows that means these reaction forces will be displayed on our screen as arrows and we want to display results only for vertical reaction forces that is FZ. at present we are not interested in moments so i will click on ok so now you can see the reaction forces are displayed as arrows and the values are written nearer to those arrows for example, here you see 273.47 kN. Here 470.38 kN. So these all values are the values of base reactions or the design reactions for designing of foundation of this building. If you can see 
the reaction forces for the columns at the center. Suppose I want to compare this column at B4, this column, and another column here at C5. The reaction forces for columns at the center is greater than the reaction forces for the columns at the edges or in the corners. This is because in these columns, the load will be coming from the slabs and all the four sides resting on these columns. So, greater design reactions will be obtained for columns in the center or in the middle as compared to the reaction forces in columns at the center or at the edges. So, these are all our values of Fz. Now, we want to take one value of Fz here and see the design of isolated footing in that case. So, I will want to take the value this 577.17 kN because this is the largest reaction force that we are getting for our building. If you hover onto this joint and place your cursor on top of this joint, here you can see the values of all six joint reactions Fx, Fy, Fz. Fx and Fy are very negligible compared to Fz. There is some value of Mx minus 7.2956 kN meter and then My and Mz are negligible. So we would like to take this value of 577.17 kN and design an isolated footing for this case. So take this value, note down this value 577.17 kN and we will now go to our Excel sheet. So here I have prepared an Excel sheet for the design of isolated footing. If you want this Excel sheet, you can comment under my video and I will be providing this. Just comment with your email address. This is not, this Excel sheet I have particularly made only for explanation for this lecture course. This is not some shortcut method or in which formulas are all linked and all nice and clean. This Excel sheet I have just prepared for the sake of explaining for this lecture. So, here first we have inserted some data, isolated width, isolated footing for grid B4. This means we are taking the reaction force for the column at grid B4. Now, let's see here, load combination I have written is dead load plus live load. But we extracted the value of our base reaction for the load combination, 1.5 dead load plus live load. What we are doing here is we are using the value of Fz, that is vertical reaction force, which is 577.17, and we are dividing that force by the factor 1.5. This 1.5 factor we have used for the load combination, 1.5 dead load plus live load. So we just want the service load at the joint. That means the design base reactions only due to the service load. So we divided that value of Fz, 577.17 by this load factor or this partial safety factor of 1.5 and we got the service load at the joint to be 384.78 kN. So why are we only using the service load combination or why are we using the force due to service load at the joint? Because as you know, while determining the safe bearing capacity of our soil in our site, already some safety factors, some large values of safety factors are already used in determining the safe bearing capacity of our site. So if we use safety factors for both bearing capacity of soil and also some safety factor for the load combination, then we are doing an uneconomical design or a very conservative design. We have already used safety factor for bearing capacity of our soil. So we don't want to use those safety factor twice Hence, we are only using the service load at the joint. So, our service load will be 384.78 kN. And similarly, grade of concrete 20 kN per meter square, or this is Newton per millimeter square. Grade of steel of grade 500. Our width of column and our depth of column are equal 350 by 350. And safe bearing capacity of soil, I am supposing that our safe bearing capacity is 130 kN per meter square. To determine the safe bearing capacity of soil, we have to perform soil test in our site. 
and that swell test gives us the value of bearing capacity it gives us the value of various bearing capacities at various depth of the swell and that bearing capacity indicates also indicates the type of foundation that may we that we may use in our site it may be either isolated footings or it may be a mat foundation or we may also have to construct a deep foundation so this safe bearing capacity we have to take the value from under from swell test and we suppose this to be under 30 kilonewton per meter square at present and we also suppose that this safe bearing capacity is located at the depth of 1.5 meter from the ground level so our depth of footing is 1.5 meter now let us assume the weight of footing and backfill that means when we construct an isolated footing we have also have to assume some weight of the footing and the backfill itself because those will also act as a vertical load in addition to the service load let us suppose the weight of the footing and backfill is 10 percent so our required base area what will be our required base area if you see this first we have to increase this service load 384.78 by 10 percent so if you can see the formula here our formula is i5 that means i5 is 384.78 into 1 plus 10 by 100 we are increasing this load by 10 percentage so 384.78 into 1.1 divided by the safe wearing capacity using that we get the required base area to be 3.25 let me write here this is 384.78 we are increasing this by 10 percentage to consider the weight of footing and backfill so into 1.1 divide by the safe wearing capacity that is 130 this will give us the required base area which comes out to be 3.25 meter square and let us assume we are building a square footing so our length and breadth of the footing will be equal and that will be 2 meter let us consider it as 2 meter hence our area of footing will be 2 into 2 it means 4 meter square which is greater than the required base area 3.25 meter square so it's okay now we saw in our previous lecture that first we will design our footing based on one way shear and then we will check the depth for two-way shear and bending moment so let us see here first thickness of footing slab based on one-way shear to determine the thickness first we have to derive the value of factored bearing pressure and what is factored bearing pressure now our factored bearing pressure we have our service load to be 384.78 we factor this load first that is 384.78 into 1.5 divided by the area of our footing will give us factored bearing pressure so our factored bearing pressure is this is bigger let me just say this smaller one our factored bearing pressure will be 384.78 into factor of 1.5 this load by area now we have to take our area of actual area of footing not our required base area because we are calculating the value of actual bearing pressure divided by 4 and we get this to be 144.29 kilonewton per meter square which if you convert to Newton per millimeter square you will get this to be 0 0.14429 Newton per millimeter square now let us assume our reinforcement percentage in the footing slab is 0 0.15 percentage as we have seen the condition of reinforcement minimum and maximum reinforcement in our footings is similar to that of slabs that is 0 0.12 percentage is the maximum amount of percentage for high strength deformed bars and if we are using mild steel bars then 0.15 percent in this case 
we assume that 0.15% reinforcement in the slab. Now, using this assumed value of reinforcement and our grade of concrete, which is M20 grade, we go to this table 19 design shear strength of concrete in IS 456 score. And as you can see here, this table gives us the value of design shear strength of concrete, which is tau C in Newton per millimeter square based on the value of percentage of steel and our concrete grid. We have assumed our percentage of steel to be 0.15 percentage. So we have to see this first row. This first row is for percentage of steel less than or equal to 0.15 percentage. And our grade of concrete, we have to see this third column. So for 0.15 percentage of steel and 20 M20 grade of concrete, our design shear strength of concrete is 0.12 Newton per mm square. This design shear strength of concrete 0.28 Newton per mm square I have taken from this same table here. Now we have our design shear strength of concrete. Now we have to check the shear resistance and shear force in case of one way shear. Always we know that our shear resistance should always be greater than the shear force. Now, how do we calculate this shear resistance and this shear force? And then how do we calculate the depth of the section which we have got at the end of this line here, D value. So for that, let me go to my presentation. I will just add one slide here. What we learned in our previous section or in our previous lecture was that if this is our footing and this is our column at the center, our critical one way shear will act at a vertical section or vertical plane which is at a distance of d d means effective depth of the footing from the face of this column so if you look in our sectional view at this vertical section we will have the critical value of one way shear and for this one way shear the shear force means it is the net upward forces that is coming onto this plane. The one way shear it refers to all the vertical upward forces that is acting on this plane. And the shear resistance is provided by the depth of this section. So let's look at this again. For one way shear condition, the shear force which is acting on this footing is the net upward forces that is coming onto this plane or this section of our footing and that shear force is resisted by the shear resistance that is developed along this vertical section. So if you look at this first what is the shear force? Our shear force is the net upward force coming onto this plane that means our factored bearing pressure which is let us suppose QU we got this value of factored bearing pressure into what is the area this is L by 2 from L by 2 we have to subtract this value of a by 2 if we say a is the side of our column and then we have to subtract this value of d and then we will get this width so this width is l by 2 minus a by 2 minus this effective depth d so we got this width and now this length will be l or b whatever you say since this is square footing so this is the area of our section if we say this section to be a b c d in plan this inside the circle we have area and q 
QU is the factor bearing pressure. So pressure into area is force and this is the shear force coming onto this section. If this is the shear force, then what is the shear resistance? What is the resistance? Our shear resistance acts on this vertical plane. So the value of our shear resistance is given by the shear design shear strength of this concrete, which we just calculated from table 19, tau C into depth of this section, D into the length of this section, because we have length acting to this plane into this plane length into depth so this gives us the area on which shear resistance acts and this gives us the design shear strength of concrete so design shear strength and area gives us shear resisting force and we know that always our resisting force should be greater than the force that is acting so for our structure to be safe the shear resistance or SR should be greater than or equal to shearing force. So our limiting condition is shearing resistance is equal to shear force. You substitute the value of shearing resistance from this equation and then substitute the value of shearing force from this equation. Everything is known here except the value of D. Determine the value of D. So this is how you find the depth of footing based on one way here. Let's go back to my Excel sheet. Here, one way shear resistance should be greater than shear force. As I discussed previously the equation, from that equation, we got the depth of footing slab to be 280.56 mm from the same equation that we discussed. And remember, our value of factored bearing pressure is this 0.14429 Newton per mm square QU. And the design shear strength of concrete is 0.28 Newton per mm square. Use these two values in our equation we just discussed. So we got our effective depth of footing slab to be 280.56 mm. Let us suppose that our total depth of footing slab is 400 mm and our cover is 50 mm and the diameter of bars in footing is 16 mm. If we do this, we get our actual effective depth of footing to be 326 mm, which is greater than the required footing depth that is 280.56 mm, hence OK. So this is the value of effective depth that we adopt 326 mm. From this 400 mm total effective depth, how we got this 326 mm effective depth of footing? Let's see here first. So, let us suppose this is our footing. Yes. And we will have, if we see the top view of the footing re reverse we will see that it is in the form of a mess that means we will be having a reinforcement in both the directions of the footing longer direction and shorter direction so let us say that this is the rebar in one direction and above this rebar we have other rebars in other direction so if we suppose our total depth of footing to be 400 mm 400 mm first we have to subtract the cover of this footing which is 50 mm now above this cover we have this rebar the diameter of which we have supposed to be 16 mm so you also have to subtract this diameter of this rebar since we have to subtract this 16 and finally we have to subtract the distance from this river to the center of upper rivers which will be 16 minus 2 that will be 80 mm and if you perform this subtraction you will get 50 and 16 is 66 66 and 8 is 74 and 400 minus 74 is 400 sorry 326 mm 
which is our considered effective depth now. I'll just discard this and go back to my Excel sheet. So our effective depth of footing is 326 mm. Now use this depth of 326 mm and check for two-way shear and bending moment. Now in two-way shear, the check is performed in the same way. We have to find the shear resistance at the critical section and shear force. In the previous one-way shear, what we did was we used the equation shear resistance is greater than shear force and we derived the value of d that is effective depth now we will use this value of d 326 mm and we will check if our shear resistance at the critical section is greater than the shear force or not we get our shear resistance to be 985 kilonewton and we get our shear force to be 511 kilonewton hence it is okay since the resistance is greater than the shear force now how we will do this for two ways here i will just go in very short because i have already shown a detailed process for one way here let's look at your diagram on the right hand side we have the critical section for shear given in for two way action so our critical section for shear or our critical perimeter for shear acts on this a b c d plane which is at a distance of d by 2 from the face of the column so our critical two-way shear acts on this outer area. We find our shear force by allowable bearing pressure into area of this outer area. To find this outer area, you can just find the total area of this footing and subtract the inner area. This will be our shear resistance and our shear, sorry, that will be our shear force. And our shear resistance will be the shear force or the strength force that acts along this critical perimeter along the depth of this section. In one way shear, we consider critical plane along one width only or one length only. So we did design shear strength of concrete tau c into depth into length. But here you have to do the design shear strength of concrete into perimeter into another value is depth so what i'm saying is let's just look here if sorry if this is our footing and this is our column this is the critical plane for two ways here which is at a distance of d by 2 from the face of the column since it is our square footing, this critical perimeter will also be a square. So now our shear force will be our shear force will be our shear force for two way shear will be our allowable bearing pressure into this whole area. If we consider L to be length or width of this footing, L square minus area of this circle let us say the perimeter of this critical section is c naught which you can find by yourself and c naught square this will give us shear force while our shear resistance so how do we calculate shear resistance if you can remember we saw in our previous lecture that our shear force was to be limited to the value ks into tau cp where what was ks ks was 0 0.5 plus beta c beta c means the ratio of shorter side to longer side of the footing and this value of ks should not be greater than one and then tau cp is 0 0.25 into root under fck so we know the value of ks now we know the value of tau cp so our shear resistance in the case of two way shear will be ks tau cp which will give us the value of force or which will give us the value of pressure into area and area will be this critical perimeter into depth because 
2 ways here will be registered by the depth along all these four sides of this critical plane. So our shear force, critical shear force acts on this outside area and this two-way shear force is registered by the shear resistance along this critical plane. And if we derive the value of shear resistance to be greater than shear force, because in this we know the value of all the parameters here, we just have to check if the resisting force is greater than shear force or not. If resisting force is greater, then our depth that we obtain from one-way shear is okay. That means one-way shear is the dominant shear force in the case of this footing or if the depth is not okay then two way shear will be dominant and then we have to change the depth so this is the case for two way shear i go back to my excel sheet i did the same here i found the shear resistance i found the shear force and since the resisting force is greater than the force acting it is okay now one check that we have to perform in the design of our footing is the check for gross bearing capacity. Let's see here. We suppose our unit weight of concrete is 25 and unit weight of soil is 18. And load on our footing is 384.78. Where did we get this 384.78? We got it from this service load. So. So calculate all the load that is acting. First calculate the weight of footing which is the unit weight of footing into its area into its height. This footing we got is 25 into area of footing that means L into B into total height which is 400 mm. So we got this total load of footing. We can calculate the total weight of soil acting on the footing also because we know the depth of footing 1.5 meter. We calculate the total volume of concrete footing and then calculate the total volume of your excavation. And if you subtract the total volume of concrete footing from that excavation portion, you get the total volume of soil acting. Multiply that volume by unit weight and you will get the total weight of soil. So, now the total force acting on the soil is this load and footing 384.78 plus 40 plus 79.2 which we get 503.98 kilonewton and if you divide this 503.98 kilonewton by the area of our footing this is what we get is gross bearing capacity and this gross bearing capacity should be less than the safe bearing capacity because the gross load that is coming on our footing or coming on the soil is under 25.99 kilonewton per meter square but the safe bearing capacity is 130 kilonewton per meter square so it's okay that our gross load coming onto the soil can be registered by the safe bearing capacity of the soil we have checked for gross bearing capacity now we want to use that depth of our footing and check for bending moment to check for bending moment, it's the same procedure. We have to determine the area of steel in one direction as it is a square footing. We consider the lower effective depth which is 326 mm. In our case, since it is a square footing, our effective depth is the same. We don't have to check which is lower or which is higher. This is our effective area or effective depth. Using this effective depth, we calculate the moment. And you know that in the previous lecture we saw the moment is critical at the face of the column itself and now you have to calculate the moment so how do you calculate this moment value mu is qu that is bearing pressure into the width of the footing divided by 8 into the width of the footing b minus the side of the column a whole square use this formula q u that means our safe our bearing pressure that we obtained that we have been using in the calculation of shear force for both one way and two way shear into width of our footing divided by 8 into the width of our footing minus 
the side of our square column this is 350 mm whole square using this formula you get the moment value to be 392.82 kilonewton meter so mu is 392 and mu by bd square is 1.84 newton per mm square just divide this by b means the width and d means the effective depth is square you get this to be 1.84 newton per mm square and then go to table 2 of asp16 in table 2 of asp16 if you look here we have one column for mu by bd square same for here and we are doing this for FCK 20 Newton per mm square that is M20 grade concrete using the value of MU by BD square and the grade of steel that is given here we determine the value of percentage of steel for singly reinforced section since we saw that in the previous lecture our isolated footings are designed as single reinforced or under reinforced we derive the value of the percentage of steel from here so mu by bd square 1.84 what we have is fck is 20 and fy is 500 so which do we have to see if you see here we have for one mu by bd square m one value 0 0.245 and for mu by bd square value 2.22 we have 0 0.602 for 500 grade steel so just interpolate between these two values 0 0.245 and 0 0.602 we get that to be 0 0.54 percentage so 0 0.54 percentage of steel means our area of steel is 3520.8 mm square just calculate the number of steel that you want to provide and also the diameter of the steel and using that you can then calculate the total area of steel i hope you can do this now this total area of steel that we have used is greater than the area of steel that we have to use so it's okay so this is how we calculate first how we check for bending moment and using this bending moment value we calculate the percentage of steel Providing slope in the footing slab, I won't be looking at the slope because for now we are only using, only designing a rectangular footing. We haven't provided any slope. So this is our rectangular footing that we have designed. We have got the value of total depth, which we took as 400 mm. We have got the value of effective depth. We know we have to use what amount of steel, that is we have to use 18 number of 16 dia bars on both sides so in this way you can do the drawing part and finally what we got i am just leaving this portion here how we provide slope in the footing slab and based on that slope we revise the depth of the footing and then we revise the area of steel also let me just leave this part here we can discuss or we may discuss this part somewhere in the future but not today finally we got our design details to be length of footing breadth of footing reinforcement and spacing of reverse so this is the our final design details for this spacing of reverse i did not discuss today but in the previous lecture i have also discussed the condition for spacing of reverse if you remember our spacing of reverse should be can you remember let me just go to my presentation and let me find it if you can remember we talked about spacing so let's see here the horizontal distance between parallel main reinforcement bars shall not be more than three times the effective depth of solid slab or 300 mm whichever is smaller so what we have to do is find three times the effective depth of our slab and 300 mm and whichever value comes smaller that spacing of reinforcement should not be exceeded since our effective depth is larger 
three times the effective depth will come even a larger value so our spacing should not be greater than 300 mm so our spacing comes out to be 237.5 mm which is okay in this way you can calculate the spacing also and for practical purposes for uh, for easy construction maneuvers you can just change this value you can increase this value to some near whole number or you can decrease this value to some near whole number but it should not be greater than 300 mm in any case so in this way we get the design details for our isolated footing also this brings us to the end of the design for footing uh, we will continue with our design classes in our next lectures and we will most probably look at the design of reinforced concrete slab uh, our lecture 10 this is lecture 10 i think uh, so our lecture 10 ends here we will meet again very soon thank you